Welcome to Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. I'm Daniel Wilde from the Institute of Public Affairs. Australia is facing its most significant challenges since World War II. Geopolitical tensions are increasing. Cultural self-confidence is in decline. The values which define us, freedom, democracy, egalitarianism and sacrifice are being put to the test. Over this special podcast series, Tony and I discuss how Australia can survive and flourish in the decades ahead. Hello, Tony, and g'day to all of our listeners. Great to be back for our first chat um, after the Voice to Parliament victory uh, for the No campaign. Uh, Tony, there's going to be a lot to chat about. I think that the the victory against the Voice to Parliament, in my view, was a major victory for the Australian way of life and a a reaffirmation that uh, mainstream Australians value our democracy and our equality and our fairness and treating everybody uh, the same. So I think we're all relieved that debate is over. Uh, But, of course, uh, there's still a lot to talk about and digest. So, Tony, I'm really looking forward to your insights uh, on The Voice and the wash-up from that. So why don't don't we just kick off? Um, You were there, I remember, on Sky News on Saturday night giving your opinion of of what had happened, and I enjoyed your commentary there. So uh, why don't we just kick off with your thoughts about um, the significance of the victory and what you take from it? There's no doubt it was a very significant moment, given the weight of money and moral pressure for, yes, the fact that 60% plus of the population nevertheless voted no uh, is very significant. Mm. I don't think people were voting no to Aboriginal people for a second. I don't even think they were voting no to Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, but they were definitely voting no to the voice. And I think in voting no to the voice, they were really voting yes to unity and yes to equality. So it was a very significant moment and as I wrote late last week, this is really one of the first occasions anywhere that an important identity politics issue has been put to a popular vote and the vote under the circumstances was a resounding rejection of uh, of identity politics. That said, I'm very mindful of Churchill's dictum. You might remember at the start of his uh, magisterial history of the Second World War, he had uh, four little pieces. He said, uh, in peace, goodwill, in defeat, defiance, in war, resolution, and in victory, magnanimity. Mm. Magnanimity. And I do think that after the division and the bitterness, let's be fair and and upfront about it, Uh, the bitterness and the division of the referendum campaign. We do need a hand of healing. Mm -hmm. Um, Something like 5 million decent Australians voted yes. I think they voted yes out of an abundance of goodwill to Aboriginal people. If you listen to good people like Father Frank Brennan, uh, he voted yes because he didn't feel after everything that's happened to Aboriginal people over the last 240 years, that in conscience he could do anything other than vote yes, even though, as we know, he had massive misgivings about the particular proposal. So so I think what we now need to do is is, um, accept the victory in a spirit of magnanimity and do our best to reach out to all the decent people who voted yes And what I think that really requires is a renewed effort to try to address the real and ongoing problems of remote Australia in particular. One of the sensible things that the Prime Minister said uh, in the wake of uh, the referendum result was that at least there has been a renewed focus on the issues of Indigenous Australia and what might be done about it. And so uh, at the risk of sounding... Uh, a bit full of myself, I, I did actually go back today and reread the speech I made to the Parliament or the statement I made to the Parliament back in late 2018. You might remember, Dan, I was the uh, special Indigenous envoy for a few months and I made a particular uh, study of Indigenous education, yeah. uh, remote Indigenous education at that time. And uh, I do think that this is the key to Indigenous advancement, because if you don't have a decent education, it's very hard 
to get a decent job. And if you don't have a decent job, it's very hard to get ahead in modern Australia. And if you don't get ahead in modern Australia, all of your other outcomes tend to be deficient. Mm -hmm. So this is the key. We've got to get more Aboriginal kids to school. We've got to do what we can to make sure that it's a good schooling. And we've got to be particularly uh, insistent that it doesn't drop off in the secondary years mm. uh, when so many uh, remote Aboriginal kids seem to drift away from school despite the best efforts of things like the Clontarf Foundation yeah, yeah. and so on. So I think that the referendum result really requires uh, not less work but more work in this area but it's got to be better and more productive work than so much of the stuff that we've been doing uh, over the last couple of decades. Mm. Um, to me, Tony, the result, as you sort of alluded to, really was a repudiation of elite opinion. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking back to your victory in 2013 where, you know, you secured the borders, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. That went against elite opinion. Yeah. Many said that you can't do it and you shouldn't do it because it's morally wrong, uh, but you did it with the backing of the public. Um, what does this say about the direction of our country. So we've got the Indigenous Affairs Matter specifically, but more broadly when you have 80% of Labor seats mm. voting against their own party and against their leader, I've never seen such a public repudiation of a governing party by their own voting base. Mm. What does this mean for the future of the country and the future of the coalition in your assessment? Well, I, I don't want to underrate the importance of what's been done and decided, but I don't want to overrate it either. Uh, I've always thought that there is a strong strand of social conservatives. Social conservatism is not quite the right term, but but there's certainly been, uh, I think, a strong strand of of basic common sense in the Australian people, um, particularly on issues that we are personally familiar with, mm. particularly on issues that we've had to think about a bit, uh, I, I, I think you can trust the judgment of the people, the collective judgment of the Australian people. And again, I stress, I don't think that the referendum outcome was in any way a sign of lack of goodwill towards Aboriginal people. I think it was... Uh, a rejection of a particular form of trying to help, which people thought, no, no, that could easily make a bad situation worse, A, because it 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 involves special measures yep. rather than equal and fair measures, uh, and B, because it looks to be more bureaucracy driven by exactly the same people who've been driving the government policy agenda mm -hmm. uh, for some decades now. So, so I, I think it was a, it was a it was a common sense result, and it was an affirmation that we want to go forward as a people together. So I think it was, if you like, a social fabric outcome. Yep. And this is where I think we on the centre right sometimes allow our uh, economic enthusiasms mm. to get the better of us. Now I was obviously. Um, Employment Minister and Workplace Relations Minister in the Howard Government. And uh, the two things that I particularly championed as Workplace Relations Minister was the rule of law through the Building Industry Royal Commission yep. and as Employment Minister was work for the dull mm. because uh, I always thought that the something for nothing mindset was wrong and with so many of these young people in particular who were long-term unemployed, They'd never had the chance to be good at anything. Yeah, They'd yeah. never had the chance to succeed at anything. And the best run work for the Dole programs were actually opportunities for these youngsters who had often failed and often been defeated to actually discover something that they could do and do well and do it in in, in company. So, so um, I I think that we need to be careful uh, on the centre right that we don't 
look like uh, we are so concerned about economics that we forget that in the end it's a means to an end. It's a means to a better society and mm. stronger communities. And as part of that, uh, I was often very uncomfortable with business submissions mm. to keep wages down because I think any of us that have actually thought about how you'd live on minimum wages would think this is going to this would be damned hard, damned hard without uh, um, uh, you know having other means of support and so on. So 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 look, I think that this vote is an encouragement uh, to people of a centre right disposition. But just because one centre right conservative disposition has been affirmed, if you like, by this vote, is not a reason to think that the whole centre-right agenda, uh, as we have typically thought of it over the last couple of decades, is going to be embraced wholeness no. bolus. I mean, we do need a more productive economy. Uh, we do need fewer rules and regulations. But in the end, it's got to be about trying to help the battler to do better. Uh, and at its best, this was one of the great strengths of the Howard government. I mean, that phrase, the Howard battlers, was an attempt to encapsulate the instinct of the Howard government to do the right thing by the working people of Australia. And as a workplace relations minister, I often used to say, uh, to much derision from the other side of the parliament, uh, that uh, the Howard government is the best friend the workers of Australia have ever had. And I also used to say, as health minister, that the Howard government is the best friend of Medicare mm. that Medicare has ever had because there are ways of doing sensible centre-right things that um, I think support the social fabric and there are ways of doing things which might, whether intentionally or not, tend to rent the social fabric and we've just got to be careful how mm. we approach these things. Well, that's quite interesting, Tony, because, I mean, one of the things that is a live topic of debate right now is, um, I mean, the narrow thing is about what's the coalition's path back to government, but that gets to a much broader issue. And I, I share your perspective that essentially from the 1980s onwards there was the emphasis on uh, economic liberalisation, globalisation, free trade, which has brought a lot of prosperity, mm. but it does unsettle. You know, if you're someone, you know, where the yes campaign was launched in Elizabeth, well, that was 70% no vote. Mm. This is where um, maybe the negative side of globalisation has come up, where they've lost their car manufacturing mm. jobs and things like that. Mm. My, my view is this is now an opportunity and a clear indication for the coalition um, to perhaps rebalance. Mm. I like when you talk about community and social mm. fabric. Um, there's a lot of Labor right voters, mm. but there's a Labor left leadership mm. that is forgetting about these people I actually reckon there's there's real once in a generation opportunity for the coalition now to, I would say rebalance. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say forget about the teal seats because every voice should count, but mm -hmm. really they're going to have to make a choice, aren't they? Between do you want to win the battlers in Elizabeth or the well-off people in Kuyong? Yes, there's some overlap, but clearly there's differences in values and and needs. Um, you know, just interested if you could maybe in a policy sense or. Mm -hmm. You know, based on your experience as leader, how would you sort of go about it now as we head into the next election? Well, I, I th we, we've we've touched on this before, but um, we aren't going to win back the teal seats by outtailing the teals. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we try to outtail the teals, I think we will deeply alienate the aspirational outer suburban seats and regional seats that we need we need to to win and hold. Yeah. I think that the best chance of winning back the teal seats is when the um, generally well-to-do people in these seats find that their economic interests are being badly damaged by a bad Labor government. Now, I don't think uh, higher pay for workers badly damages the economic interests of, of better off people, not mm. at all. Uh, I think that in the medium term, at least, certainly helps the economic interest because I don't think that market capitalism is a zero-sum game. Mm. I don't believe that for a second. Uh, I think the bigger the pie, uh, 
the more for everyone as opposed to more for me means less for you, which is the typical Marxist position or neo-Marxist position. So, so, so I, I think that uh, what we essentially need to win back the teal seats is to have very good candidates, uh, people who these uh, rather successful electors can look at and identify with. We need very good candidates and then we just need to demonstrate uh, that our economic management is better than Labor's. So we aren't looking to increase uh, taxes. Uh, we are looking to increase productivity, but not by attacking the worker, mm. by trying to ensure that businesses are able to do things better in a kind of a collegial way. Um, but in the end... Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter where you get the votes and the seats. Yeah, yeah. You've just got to have fifty uh, percent plus one of the seats, and that's why I think what we we can say is that there are opportunities for the coalition in vast swathes of metropolitan Australia, which might have been thought of as as safe Labor, just as the teal seats were once thought of as safe Liberal. But under certain circumstances, they turned out not to be. I think there are a lot of seats in parts of Sydney and Melbourne, for instance, that are thought of as safe Labor. But again, with the right candidates and the right policies, I think we could uh, we could surprise people. Well, I think that's right. I mean, my observation living in Melbourne is there's a lot of um, Labor voters that are now rethinking their commitment to Labor. We saw that in the uh, 2022 federal election at a lot of um, outer suburban Labor seats, but they weren't ready to vote Liberal. So they'd vote One Nation, UAP, Lib Dem, but they'd preference the Labor. So the 2PP wasn't changed a lot, no. although the primary vote was changed. Um, so they've taken the first step. They've also taken the obvious step of, of going against, I mean, this, I just can't believe how dramatic this is. Like, we're, again, when they launched the campaign in Elizabeth, that went 70% no. Uh, uh. So they're, they're independent thinkers. They won't just do what they're told. Um, Correct. What and, the coalition now needs to do is give them a reason to vote coalition. And, 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 and we need to talk about the things that they're interested in. Now, what, what are people in these aspirational suburbs interested in? Mm. They're interested in higher pay. Yep. They're interested in their kids being able to buy a house. They're interested in their kids and grandkids being able to get a very good education. And yes, they want to ensure that the health system is working for them and they want, it, they want the kind of improving infrastructure all the time so that you don't spend half your life stuck in traffic jams. So, so look, I, I think these are areas and, okay, there's the usual federal state issue, but yeah. I think these are all areas where a sensible centre-right coalition can make big inroads. I, I think in our own way we did it in 2013 yep. and I think that um, the miracle win of 2019 was in a sense uh, a belated reappeal to all of that after the difficulties of 2016 and, and I certainly think that there will be some big opportunities for the coalition come the next election uh, if we get the balance right. And I guess uh, quite apart from the extraordinary leadership of uh, Jacinda Price and mm -hmm. Warren Mundine and Karen Little through this, through this recent referendum campaign, I do think that the, 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 one of the heroes of it was Peter Dutton who – could easily have sat on the fence. He could easily have, uh, uh, you know, given a free vote. Um, but when the polls were still looking very good for the voice, he said, look, uh, it's not just a problem of lack of detail. There's a problem of principle here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like the idea of entrenching what is effectively a race-based body in the constitution and so we're going to vote no. And he did that despite the fact that there was some pretty serious divisions inside the shadow cabinet and some divisions inside the party room as well. So, so he showed policy and political courage. And policy and political courage does not always get rewarded in terms of 
whether people like you or not, but it mm. often does get rewarded yeah. in terms of the actual electoral outcome. Yeah, no, that, that that's right. People, people, after a while, will get a sense of yeah. who they're dealing with. Yeah. And on that topic, I wanted to ask you about how you reckon Anthony Albanese is going. Um, my assessment is that he's not doing very well. Uh, I don't think his referendum night speech was very good. I saw it as a speech to the activists, not to the people of Australia, which was in line with his uh, election night speech where the first thing he said was we commit to Uluru from the heart. Then he thanked the Australian public for his win. Mm. Um, I'm not and, – and watching Question Time uh, last week, he seems shell-shocked uh, by this. Uh. I don't think he has it within him to, to actually – there's a lack of curiosity as to why this happened. They're saying it's misinformation or they're blaming Dutton for a lack of bipartisanship. Those are the only two explanations. I think he's in real trouble. Unless he, unless he reflects on why Australians voted no, it wouldn't surprise me if he really struggles to make it to the next election as leader. Um, so I, that's my sense at the moment. I know it's early days, but that's just my sense from reading and listening to him that he's a bit detached. Well, I don't think uh, one should under, underestimate the magnitude of uh, the event and it wouldn't be all that surprising for the effective leader of the Yes campaign to be a bit shell-shocked by the outcome, particularly given the way it was constantly pitched in moralistic terms. So yeah. If you're decent and respectful, you'll vote yes, and if you don't, well, there are these big question marks about you. So, so I can understand a degree of shell shock there. Um, in the end, uh, the result just has to be accepted. It has to be accepted. Uh, in a democracy, you might not like the outcome, but you have to accept it. And you've, you've got to appreciate that the voters had reasons that were good to them. And if the reasons were good to the voters, uh, you've got to take them extremely seriously. Yeah. Now, I think the difficulty that the Prime Minister and the Labor Party might now have, um, and I think we saw elements of that in the statement out today uh, from elements of the Yes campaign, uh, they, they are having trouble accepting that the whole voice, treaty, truth agenda was rejected. Mm -hmm. And while they are reluctantly accepting, I think, that there can't be a constitutionally entrenched governmentally sponsored voice, uh, they, they now are, are looking for this sovereign voice, in inverted commas, and they're still talking about treaty and truth. Now, I think the government has to say, look, if there is, is one thing that this referendum decided, uh, it is that we've got to look to practical improvements rather than uh, anything which suggests that there are two or more categories of Australian. Mm. And once you start trying to negotiate treaties, mm. I think uh, there's a fundamental problem. How does a sovereign country uh, negotiate a treaty with its own citizens or a portion of its own citizens? And, and, and that raises, I mean, I mean, there is this reluctance to accept on the part of, the, of, of, of many Aboriginal activists that, that the sovereignty of the Crown uh, supplanted any other sovereignty uh, in the years after 1788 and there's no going back. There is no going back. You cannot undo 240 years of history, uh, however you might have wished it were otherwise back then or even now. And then there's this whole truth-telling thing. Now, um, Australians are on balance proud of our country. We don't think it's perfect, but we think it's better than just about anywhere else. And the truth-telling that the activists are on about is – uh, a so-called truth-telling about genocide, about oppression, about massacres, uh, about injustice. And I'm not saying that there, there, there weren't some massacres. Of course there were. The Mile Creek is the obvious example. But that 
was never the whole story. Mm. And it is less and less even a part of the story as time goes by. Mm. And I just think that all of us have to accept um, that this is a good country that we need to make better rather than, in a sense, give ourselves a collective nervous breakdown mm. uh, through endless self-flagellation over things that we can't change and we can't undo the past. All we can do is try to make the present and the future better. I just want to ask you one more question about the wash up of the results of The Voice and I wouldn't mind asking you about, um, I mentioned misinformation before, we might talk about um, where this might be headed. Yeah. One of the things that struck me through the campaign was um, the so-called migrant mm. vote and I think it's wrong to have the migrant vote because as we know they're all individuals in different communities but on balance it appears to be the case that migrants were more likely to vote yes than non-migrants and there were subsets particularly it appears the Chinese community was much more likely to vote yes than other migrant communities. Um, we need to look at more of the polling and so forth and the reasons for that but does that like, like to me, I find that a bit concerning that because the whole idea of our nation is you're you know we used to have the phrase a a new Australian mm -hmm. that we're all equal, mm -hmm. and the term new Australian was there to encourage my the migrants themselves to see themselves as Australian, but more importantly to encourage existing Australians to see new migrants as their equal, and the voice to Parliament would have undermined that whole concept of one person one vote, which is you know many migrants would come here to get away from countries where you have this kind of Division. Mm. Um, is this? Do you see this as perhaps the the consequence of just um, uh, sort of a, a a mindset that they will follow what the Labor Party says? Is it political? Is it a cultural thing? I'm just trying to unpack well, what then, this might mean. I, I'd be reluctant, uh, in the absence of much deeper analysis of the of the results, to conclude that migrants were that different from the rest of us. Um, uh, I don't get a sense that migrants were more yes than no. Uh, I don't get that sense. Um, and I must say, uh, I would have thought that recent migrants in particular would have been very wary of any proposal that appeared to give special mm. um, a special say to people based on the length of their ancestry in this country. So, so, so I think migrants should have been rather wary of this whole thing. Mm. So I, I just think it's too soon to start drawing conclusions on, on that. I mean, I, I, I just think that you're right. Uh, the great strength of this country up until now and now hopefully continuing far into the future forever uh, is the approach we've always had. You can turn up here mm. and provided you're prepared to have a go and join the team, doesn't matter whether you've been here for one day, one year, or your ancestors has been have been here for centuries or millennia. You're a first class Australian. Mm. It's your commitment to the country and your readiness to have a go, and and I think that's a wonderful feature of this place. And and I think we have in our own different ways affirmed that mm. in this in this vote. Okay, so I just want to sort of round out the, the chat today just with um, sort of where this might be going next. So the government has clearly laid down markers in relation yeah. to um, uh, in relation to misinformation and disinformation, um, effectively blaming yeah. people mm. for not understanding um, what it is that they were being asked to yeah. vote on, um, which I think is a very dangerous path to go down. Mm. I'm just interested in your perspective on, on this matter. Uh, I accept that there are do appear to be elements in the government that mm. are enthusiastic for it and uh, I hope they might uh, rethink and think better. I think that uh, our energies, at least in respect of Indigenous policy, have got to be directed towards improving remote education. And if I can go back to um, that statement to Parliament from 2018, mm -hmm. um, I do think that we have to ensure that remote area teachers are better awarded and I think there need to be significant retention bonuses uh, to encourage people to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that uh, the federal government should consider waiving the HEX debt 
uh, of uh, of teachers with some experience who then volunteer to go out and and, and teach for a significant period of time uh, in remote areas. Uh, I do think that where communities are prepared to accept a responsibility to ensure that they get school attendance rates up to 90%, uh, the government ought to be prepared to look at maybe Mm -hmm. some benefits to the community if there is some particular thing that they want. Uh, I, I, I do think that the quality of teaching in remote schools, uh, and this is where Noel Pearson and I uh, agreed back in the day on phonics uh, through the Good to Great Schools program. I think that's very important. Um, I think things like the Clontarf program are very important, no school, no sport. I think that the Indigenous Education Foundation program where you try to get uh, kids into seriously good uh, boarding schools uh, if they've got the potential. And I do think we we have to look at how do we uh, ensure that there are consequences for parents if their parenting does not include serious efforts to make sure the kids go to school. Now, this was something that I was looking at in government and um, I didn't have long enough to... Uh, uh, to really bring it to a landing point, but um, uh, parenting payments, um, I think, should include a school attendance component. Now, the logistics of actually getting this done are difficult, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're impossible uh, because at the moment, while everyone is obliged uh, to send their kids to school by law, in practice, particularly in remote places, it's not happening. Mm. And law enforcement is taken seriously when we look at things like traffic offences and so on. Law enforcement needs to be taken more seriously when it comes to school attendance. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't think we are going to bring about the sustained improvements that we need. No, well, Tony, I think that's uh, probably a good note for us to, to wrap up on. And you have, throughout your time as Prime Minister and in opposition have been someone that actually went out to many of these communities in East Arnhem Land and so forth and saw on the ground the challenges. So I think the your observations and analysis of this issue bring a lot of weight. And I think a lot of Australians are hoping that we can now sort of move on as a nation, hopefully put this race based division, treaty, truth telling behind us and as you say, get to the practical things that need to be solved. So Well here's hoping. Uh, but as I said, uh, I don't think this in any way as it were, takes Indigenous issues off the table. No. I think it just means we need a new and better focus on the practical outcomes. Absolutely. Tony, always appreciate you coming in and your insights and analysis, and um, thank you very much uh, for being here. Good on you, Dan. This is a production of the Centre for the Australian Way of Life at the Institute of Public Affairs. To find out more, visit australia.ipa.org.au.